that's a part of the um, and actually, we have a lot of conservation work we do around the world. That's great. I have not been actually, but have been really wanting to go and check it out. I love it. Let me know what it is. Yeah. So, do you have any youth programs um, that align with conservation? We do. Deborah Luke, Senior Vice President of Conservation at the Florida Aquarium. Dr. Deborah Luke joined the Florida Aquarium as the Senior Vice President of Conservation in January 2020 and has over 25 years of marine and environmental conservation leadership experience. Before joining the aquarium, Dr. Debbie served as the Executive Director of the Society for Conservation Biology, where she oversaw the strategic business planning for seven regional global sections and 35 international chapters, supported the development of international collaborations that addressed critical environmental and conservation issues, and managed the administration of three of the world's most prestigious peer-reviewed conservation-based scientific journals. Prior to that, she served as Senior Vice President of Conservation and Science at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums for nearly a decade. One of her significant accomplishments while at AVA was the successful launch of the field conservation programs that supported FAFE, AVA's premier Saving Animals from Extinction program, dedicated to marine conservation and collaborative conservation efforts with our communities. She also served as the Director of Education and Research at Sea Life Park in Hawaii and as the Director of Manatee Care and Research during 10 years at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. Come on up, Dr. Deborah Lee. I clearly got the long version of that one. <laughs> so thank you. I am your most sparkly speaker tonight, apparently. So I think that this festival and this whole event is aptly named Hope Spot, right? We need hope. There's a lot of things going on in our world right now which can be overwhelming. And it, a lot of it is messaging that is sent to us that's depressing, or it makes you feel like there's nothing you can do. And I'm here to tell you that that's completely opposite. I think inspiration comes with hope and vice versa. So I'm gonna show you a picture. This is me with long curly hair up here and Dr. Sylvia Earl, back when I worked at Moat. And she was one of the ladies who inspired me. Eugenia Clark was another one. And Sylvia Earl was an amazing woman who, when you think about what she did back in the day, was just outstanding. So she inspired me. And I hope that when I look around and I see some of these younger folks that are here, Paige, you are amazing, and others here, that is what gives me hope, looking for the future. So I'm going to put that down. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about um, some of the conservation work that we do at the Florida Aquarium. So we have two different campuses. One is in downtown Tampa. Another one is in Apollo Beach, which is about 20 miles south of uh, Tampa. And we, much like Moat, use a science-based impact-driven approach. Um, but we also started with public aquarium, rather than the opposite, with the science-first and now going to the aquarium. <laughs> Next to this. 
Um, we have an annual reach, you can just keep picking and on this one, of uh, about 80,000 in our education groups that come in, formalized education programs, 2,000 in our programming, uh, sorry, 200,000. And then we're, this year we're on scale to meet more than a million visitors. Uh, last year was a record year for us. This year will be over a million visitors. So our messaging is really important. How we talk to people, what we talk to people about, and how we empower people to make a difference really matters. So we have four priorities that we focus on. Generating healthy habitats. We do a lot of mangrove oil planting, a lot of restoration projects. Um, reducing single-use plastic consumption and pollution. We do a lot of cleanups, a lot of things you've heard some of our other speakers talking about, and partnerships. Um, advancing our sustainable business and operations plan. We're proud to say that at the end of this year, we will be 100% plastic bottle free <laughs> at the aquarium. So we're changing vendors, we're doing a lot of different things with that. We will be uh, zero, but I'm sorry, we will be net zero by 2035. So we've got that all plotted out. So we're excited about that. And then safeguarding wildlife species. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. I'm not gonna go into great detail, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more information. Um, one of the things we do in our Apollo Beach campus is sea turtle rehab. Uh, we have a whole center down there where we bring in uh, sea turtles that have stranded either along the Florida coast um, or from New England, oftentimes we get cold stone turtles different times of the year. So we not only bring those turtles in, rehabilitate, to rehabilitate them and send them back out, but we also are starting to put satellite tags on some of those turtles. There's been a lot of tagging information that's come in over the years, primarily females that are nesting on the beach, because you can kind of tag out them real easily while they're laying their eggs, and then you find out their migration patterns of where they're going. But a lot of the turtles we get in are young turtles, and juvenile, they're about this big, and they're flown down from New England, and then we release them off the coast of Florida. We don't know what they're doing. So we're tagging those, and you can see those live on our website now where they're going, which is kind of cool. Okay. Um, but what I'm gonna spend more time talking about is coral. So how many of you know that Florida has the third largest barrier coral reef in the world? Okay, I'm impressed. It's, Probably a quarter of you. Um, we do, and a lot of people don't even recognize that. Right now, it's being impacted and has been for several years by stony coral tissue loss disease. So it's a disease we don't know what's causing it. Um, there's a variety of factors, as I'm sure you can imagine, that people are looking at for what's causing it. But it's down gone all down the whole coast, and it's heading even further south. Um, and it's affected the stony corals that we have on our reef, the reef building corals. We've lost about 96% of those corals along the whole reef at this point. So you can see here, the slides, how it's changed over the, over the time here. Next. Um, so what has happened is uh, the agency that governs uh, the corals has made an unprecedented approach several years ago. They went out and they actually collected healthy corals along the reef before the disease margin in the reef. This isn't typical. So most of these corals have never been in human care, trying to learn how to feed a coral. A coral is a living animal, right? You know that. It's not a rock. Um, trying to figure out what to feed them and how to help them survive and thrive in human care is challenging. So they collected hundreds and hundreds of these corals, different species, and they're spread out across different aquaria. And we have a lot of them at the Florida Aquarium. So this is in our Apollo Beach campus. Those are greenhouses there. So if you think it's hot in Florida working outside, try working in the middle of a field in a greenhouse in Florida in August. Um, inside these greenhouses are the tanks with a lot of these, what we're calling broodstock corals now. Corals, again, are living animals, right? So they breed once a year, a certain time of year, and that's it. Once a year, that's all you get. Next. So what we've done is we partnered with um, the Horniman Museum in London, where they took Pacific corals and they put them in a laboratory environment like this, and they computerized everything. Everything from water temperature to salinity to moon phase to everything. And they were able to get Pacific soft corals to spawn when they were normal during the wild. Now what you do when the coral spawns is you take all those gametes and you put them together and make little tiny baby things that settle on tiles and so forth, and they grow into adult corals. 
So we wanted to try to do the same thing with the Atlantic corals. If we could do hard corals, then we would be making a big contribution to conservation. Because right now, the corals that have survived out there are so far apart that they're considered functionally extinct. They're too far apart for their gametes to get together. So we set up a lab the same way. And what we were able to do is to mimic the conditions in the Keys, a certain place in the Florida Keys, and have the coral spawn. So you're going to get to see a spawn. You might have to hit play, I'm not sure. There it's playing. So this is a pillar coral. This is one of the most important corals. <laughs> huh? It's amazing. Pillar coral is one of the most important reef building corals. You can hit next if you want to go to the next one. And then this is a different one. See the different types, right? So this is a group brain coral. So there's different types of ways that corals spawn. Some are just eggs, some sperm, some mixed together as eggs that are fertilized. Most of the corals that came in, we didn't even know what kind of spawners they were. And you think about how scientists are doing this down in the Keys. Oftentimes you have divers that go on a boat, right? It's at nighttime because they only spawn at night. And you put a net over a coral and you hope it spawns on the one night a year that it's gonna spawn. And if you happen to get that in the dark while you're diving, then you have all the spawn, you have to get back on the boat, you have to go back to land, you have to do all the stuff together. We can do all this in the lab now. It's right there, which is really amazing. So this is our history. We're, you know, we're learning as we go, right? You can see over the years, we started with two species. Last year, we went up to 13 species that were spawning. So that's pretty cool. What that means then is that we have lots and lots and lots of babies. That's a good thing, right? Problem is, what do we do with all those babies? So to me, conservation is all about collaboration. It's not just scientists working together, it's everybody working together. It takes NGOs, it takes corporations, it takes all the different partners, and it takes all of you, all the individuals working together. So we've been able to partner with a variety of different universities and others that are now looking at resiliency work. So they wouldn't be able to do this if they didn't have babies. They couldn't look at corals. We know the genetics of every one of our corals now. So we can put coral A and coral B together and make little coral AB babies and see if they're more tolerant to warmer waters, to more acidic waters. And we can, we can play with that a little bit and see what we can do to help with resiliency work. Next. And so we do a lot of outplanting. We have the corals that have been raised and sent out. This picture up here on your right, top right, um, Patrick is the shorter gentleman, and you can see that the corals have like these sticks sticking up. What we found is that these corals, if we plant those corals in the upper keys, and we plant them in the lower keys, the ones in the lower keys do fine. The ones in the upper keys, the parrotfish come by and they think, oh, that's a perfect appetizer. And they eat your little babies and they grow up for two years, <coughs> which is very depressing. <laughs> so Patrick was an engineer, he's retired, and he came up with this idea to drill holes in the tiles and put these barbecue shish kebab skewers that dissolve in the water up so they're pointy. And it protects the coral from the parrotfish. So we call them Patrick's parrotfish protectors. <laughs> but it takes everybody to come up with these ideas. Next, please. So what we're doing is we're growing. We now have an expansion of 4,900 square foot building. Um, that's the green part. The blue is the greenhouses that we have already. So we're expanding so that we have more room for the corals uh, that we're rearing and breeding. Um, and we're already full. It's not even built yet. And we've already got reservations booked in the whole place. Next. Oh, so this is, uh, I think, my closing slide. Just talking about all the different things that we have been doing for all of this. And what I want to say here is this is... You know, we're doing a lot of stuff. We have the solar panels up there. We have our sustainability things. We have all of our sea turtle work. We're doing a lot of work with African penguins in Africa. There's a lot of things that the Florida Aquarium is doing. But our problems are way too big these days for us to do it alone. You can't work in silos anymore. Conservation can't be done in silos. It has to be done in partnership. With, we partner with Moat on coral stuff all the time. So we have to work together and you, as individuals, have a lot of power. You have power in who you vote for locally, statewide, nationally. You have a lot of power in what your actions are every day. 
You don't need to do everything, and you don't need to feel guilty if you're not doing everything. Just do something. Figure out something you can do and model that for your circle of influence. Next time you go to takeout, you go to a restaurant and you have takeout, don't take the straw. You don't need the straw, you're right. But bring a collapsible silicone container that fits in your purse or your glove compartment and use that for leftovers instead of the styrofoam. Everybody else around you, I guarantee you, will look at you and say, oh, that's a fabulous idea. Do something. I have hope today because of all of you in here. And I think all of you are going to make a difference as we go forward in the future. So thank you. Yeah.